Um, welcome. This is going to be an exciting day and certainly an exciting few days uh, with what's happening with the showcase. So we'll get rid of that ugly picture. Ten years ago was the last time that this event was in the United States, and I remember it somewhat well. Uh, at that time, I was on the board, and it was uh, in Washington. And we dodged a bullet this time, but back then, uh, the U.S. was in a shutdown. Uh, but I must say, our United States hosts did a fabulous job to make sure everyone had great time uh, when we were in Washington. Uh, for this showcase, we have two internationally renowned, renowned uh, keynotes. Uh, we have 65 plus concurrent sessions. And in person and virtually, we have over 550 attendees. Uh, so there will be lots to talk about and lots of excitement. And we have 45 countries participating. This wouldn't happen without our sponsors. And I want to thank all of the sponsors for their dedication and their support. Uh, they work with us on a regular basis in what we do every day, but they also step up and support what we're doing here, which is to spread the word and allow people to talk and dialogue and work together to make healthcare better for humankind. I'm now going to turn it over to the co-CEO, Brian Carlson. Come on down. Thank you, Don. Hello, everybody. My name is Brian Carlson from West Coast Informatics, and I love terminology. <laughs> West Coast Informatics has advocated for the use of SNOMED uh, in the US and internationally with the customers we've worked with for over 10 years now. We're a longtime tooling vendor for SNOMED International itself, building some of the key tools for creating derivatives like ref sets and mappings. Um, and we're currently engaged in a project to do an automated map between SNOMED and ICD-11. These are things we'd love to talk about if you're interested. <laughs> and we've been a key sponsor of this expo for a number of years, which we're really happy about and always proud to be here and participate in that way. We're a remote first company and we, because this is in the US, we actually brought quite a lot of people here with us. You could hear the cheering squad earlier. Uh, so I'm sure you'll see people around with their West Coast Informatic badges, say hi, um, and you know, feel free to ask any questions about what we do. Um, our mission as a company is to democratize access to healthcare terminologies, whether that be SNOMED or LOINC, ICD-10 or ICD-11, or your national drug extensions or research, clinical, uh, research terminologies. Our goal is to make it possible for organizations to, as easily as possible, have access to exactly the codes or mappings or value sets that they need when they need them, in the form they need them, so where they need them, the versions they need, um, and to do that at any level of scale or performance at a kind of affordable price. So we think every piece of healthcare data that exists in the world should have a code, at least one code that goes with it. Um, I have a feeling we're gonna hear a little bit about the US CDI, which is a healthcare interoperability standard in the US. And we wanna enable things too, like clicking a single button to have access to the suite of terminologies that back a standard like USCDI. Um, to the end of trying to enable greater and broader access, we're doing a session that I encourage everybody to come to called Beyond the Browser at uh, noon today in Hub 2. Uh, we've essentially loaded the SOMAT IPS and uh, some ICD-10 CM content into an Atlassian Confluence browser uh, to show sort of additional ways for non-technical users to interact with content in a natural tool that everyone's familiar with, with opportunities for sort of community collaboration for suggesting and developing content and things like that. Uh, so please um, attend our session or ask us about it. Um, it's publicly available. And so we're gonna leave it up for everybody to play around with when we're done. This term wiki, as we're calling it, is powered by TermHub, which is really the thing we're excited, most excited about here, our next generation healthcare terminology solution. You can think of it as a kind of informatics as a service platform where we're trying to enable anyone to quickly get access to any of the terminologies or versions of the terminologies they're interested in, interact with them in various forms and have a developer up and running with an API in under five minutes. Um, and we're launching a public beta of this tool at the conference here. So come by our booth and ask us questions about it. 
um, or go sign up uh, for the waitlist at terminologyhub.com. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker today. Mickey Tripathi is National Coordinator for Health Information Technology at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, where he leads uh, formulation of federal health IT strategy, coordinates health IT policies, standards, programs, and investments. In 20 years working in healthcare IT, Dr. Tripathi has been Chief Alliance Officer for Arcadia, a health data and software company focused on public uh, population health and value-based care. Project Manager of the Argonaut Project, an industry collaboration for accelerating the adoption of FIRE across the healthcare industry, and a board member of HL7, the Sequoia Project, Commonwealth Health Alliance, and the Karen Alliance. Uh, his resume is quite long, and I'm not going to go through all of it. I'm sure you can find it online. <laughs> and now, let me welcome Dr. Tripathi to the stage. Thank you, Brian, um, and thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, SNOMED plays an instrumental role in everything that we're trying to accomplish, and we really deeply appreciate the partnership that ONC has had, as well as the you know the U.S. government at large has um, has had with SNOMED, and we look forward to more. I know, you know I think the recent work you've been doing with Loink is just you know sort of an indication of the mission orientation that you know that all of you in this room have about you know, trying to help us solve our problems, trying to help us you know, sort of align as much as we can around standards-based exchange to be able to get the kind of interoperability that all of us want. So I've got a lot of slides here. I hope you have seat belts. Um, I would suggest that you buckle them. Um, and, you know, and thinking about, well, what should I cover today? What are the things that the SNOMED folks are gonna wanna be interested in? It was hard for me to stop um, because I think you're involved in so many, um, so many things and the work that you do is so foundational for almost everything we do that I ended up not being able to take out a whole lot. So that means that we're gonna do a broad sweep of a whole bunch of things that ONC is, uh, is working on. Hopefully um, things that give you sort of a perspective on all the various areas that we're covering and really look forward to the Q and A um, so that I can be most responsive to what you're interested in talking about. So why don't we get started? ONC, I think as uh, hopefully most of you know, but just to do a complete level set here, we were founded in 2004 by executive order, established statute 2009. Um, our mission is, I think I think of it as a horizontal and vertical. The horizontal is um, uh, uh, you know, working on alignment of health IT strategy across the US government. So not just within the Department of Health and Human Services, the statute and our mission is to work across the US government on the formulation of health IT strategy at large. We also work in a vertical manner, which is working with the market, um, doing everything we can to align that federal government strategy to enable an open architecture, um, interoperable ecosystem based on open industry standards that ultimately benefits patients, um, you know, first and foremost. So that's kind of the, you know, sort of the two dimensional uh, mission we have. Our superpowers, as they were, your superpowers are always in what statutes and rules say that you can do, um, are in a couple of different dimensions. One is certification of electronic health records. I think as all of you probably know, in 2010, as a part of the High Tech Act, ONC was given the authority to certify um, electronic health records. At the time, that was about 10% of provider organizations that had electronic health records. We are now at the point, after a lot of hard work, $35 billion in federal incentives, at least an equal amount, I'm sure, on the, on the private side. And that doesn't include the blood, sweat, and tears of everyone who um, continues to work on implementing those systems. We are now at the point that 97% of hospitals and 86% of the ambulatory practices across the country are using certified electronic health record systems, right? It's really a remarkable achievement. I think when we stand back and just take a look at how much has been accomplished in a relatively short period of time for the most complicated part of the biggest sector of the biggest economy in the world, right? I mean, I think it's a little bit breathtaking actually when you when you think back on you know what has been accomplished. And yes, it's messy. Yes, it's not perfect. Yes, people hate their you know electronic health records. That all goes along with success, I would argue. Um, and you know, and, and trying to get people to move to a more modern way of uh, you know of delivering healthcare. Uh, so that certification program is enormously beneficial, I think, uh, you know, for our, uh, not only for U.S. government policy, but I would argue for the market at large. It's one of the only things that provides a uniform floor, a lowest common denominator across a very, very fragmented healthcare delivery system. 
so that you have the reliance that if you're in Nome, Alaska, or Portland, Maine, or Sarasota, Florida, or Phoenix, Arizona, if you're trying to get information out of any arbitrary electronic health record system, you can count on some basic functionality being there. And yes, it's not perfect, but there is a minimum expectation that you can have, and that's enormously helpful to the healthcare industry, and we wouldn't have it otherwise if we didn't have these kinds of policies. The other set of authorities come from the 21st Century Cures Act, um, 2000, passed in 2016, seven years ago. I'm gonna um, reemphasize that point as we just think about you know, what we're trying to do here. Seven years ago, the, 2000, the 21st Century Cures Act um, was passed, had three things in it, and I'll dive into each of these in greater detail. Information blocking provisions, which were the first authority given to ONC regarding the behavior of the users of health IT. Up until now, the certification was more on the supply side, right? It really just applied to the vendors. It said, we can say something about the technologies that needed to be in place for those participating in CMS uh, payment programs, but we didn't have really any authority over how people use those systems. The information blocking provisions come along and say, drop that in ONC's lap and say, no, you actually have something to say about that. And we'll talk in, in detail about what that is and where we are on that. Standards. Um, establish the US CDI as a minimum data set for the healthcare delivery system. Um, also directed ONC to, um, uh, you know, to move forward with API-based exchange so that healthcare can finally discover the internet. I don't know if you've heard of the internet. It's a really cool tool, I hear, and it's got a lot of prospects, so we ought to be using it uh, more than we use it today. And then finally, TEFCA. Trust Exchange Framework and Common Agreement, don't worry about what that stands for. Just think of the acronym TEFCA, like you think about HBO. Um, you don't know what it stands for, but you know what it is. Um, and TEFCA is nationwide network to network interoperability. So all those things are you know, sort of key authorities that we have and key levers that we're using to try to accomplish our goals. One other thing I should mention that may not be apparent to you, but certainly in SNOMED, I think it will be of interest to you because the work that you do applies across federal agencies, not just with electronic health records, is that there is a um, sub-regulatory policy that was put into place by Secretary Becerra about a year and a half ago. Um, it's a department policy that is now fully in place that requires that all HHS agencies so that's all Secretary Becerra has authority over, but all HHS agencies are required to support in all of their policies and all of their funding vehicles. That's contracts, grants, whatever it is, they are required to support ONC approved standards for clinical data exchange and clinical data um, at large. So the idea is that we have too much um, fragmentation just within the department as our different agency partners who are doing great things and they're trying to tap into health information technology systems, which is what we all wanted. And that was the goal of being able to invest public dollars in you know, motivating providers to adopt these systems. But now we recognize that across the department, we've got too much disparate approaches to the use, to the leveraging of that data out of electronic health record systems that ONC and CMS have spent a lot of time and a lot of effort getting providers to do it in particular ways. We don't want our agency partners to be fragmenting that and, um, and you know, not having that kind of alignment. We also don't have enough synergy across the Department of Health and Human Services, across our operating divisions and staff divisions in the efforts that they have. So there's still a little bit too much siloing across the department. That's what the secretary put this policy in place to say that all of these, all of our agency partners, we need to all work together and say, we're gonna move forward on the standards that have already been approved by the secretary and they're already promulgated in regulations that are driving the healthcare industry. So you'll see more of that. I mean, obviously that doesn't happen overnight, but that applies again to all of our um, HHS agency partners. So we're working hard with CDC, FDA, NIH, HRSA, CMS, you know, all of those agencies to, you know, to get this more and more in place. And we're doing a ton of technical assistance to our agency partners to help them along the way. Um, so where are we? I like to you know, sort of draw the, the Gartner hype curve um, for you know, thinking about where we are and to also give you a sense of why I'm really, really still after two and a half years, which feels like about 10 years, um, so excited to be in the role that I am um, at this particular time. So all of you are hopefully familiar with the Gartner hype curve. You know, my eighth health information technology um, overlay on that is, you know, we started off like in late 90s, you know, early 2000s, the to air is human, the um, is to the medicine report came out, um, which I think was pretty, you know, sort of shocking to most people. Um, by the way, that data hasn't really changed. So we've got a lot of work to do still, but it pointed out 
that you know the very very high incidence and prevalence of um, medical errors in our healthcare delivery system, and also started the conversation as people were thinking about it, the sort of the correlation of saying, "Geez, we have a lot of medical errors in our system that we weren't aware of." We also are the laggards of the industrialized world and the use of health information technology, and that started on the course of saying we really need to think about driving adoption of health information technology across um, the U.S. healthcare delivery system. That was led to the founding of ONC in 2004 and a wide variety of things. And the High Tech Act came along in 2010. I know a number of you were here back then. A number of you weren't. Um, but I know a number of you were here, or a number of you were, but you were in nursery school. A number of you were here um, at that time. And I think can remember, um, certainly before the High Tech Act, a number of us, as we were looking at this, trying to build health information exchanges and trying to do stuff, were facing the problem of how do you build a phone system when no one has phones? How do you build an ATM network when no one has ATMs, right? And that was the challenge that we had. My, you know, my, uh, uh, the first uh, national coordinator, David Brailler, did a ton of great work. But as you look at that, it was like, we're going to create all these great networks. And it all was a great vision. But it was like, but no one has electronic health records. So how are we going to do this? Um, the High Tech Act came along, and it was a godsend for the industry. Um, it was a godsend. It allowed the federal government to invest in its supply chain to get the supply chain to invest in technology that they weren't otherwise willing to do. Um, and that led to meaningful use and all of our excitement, right? We're going up the peak of inflated expectations. We're gonna have all sorts of great stuff. Everything's gonna be automated. Um, and, you know, we hit meaningful use stage two and all of a sudden people are like, oh, this is, I, I'm still excited, but boy, this is kind of hard. And then meaningful use stage three was like, oh my God, <laughs> what are we doing here? This is really, really hard. And people started to confront as I, um, encountered personally with, uh, we implemented electronic health records in 2005 across in uh, three markets in Massachusetts um, with a large grant from Blue Cross Blue Shield at the time and had a number of providers who were just incredibly articulate who said, you know what, it, this has exposed for me that our problems in healthcare are deeper than just technology. That we implemented electronic health records, but then we hit the brick wall of our healthcare system, which is about policies and processes and misaligned incentives and all of that, right? And I think all of that was sort of coming together with Meaningful Use Stage 3 as well as just, you know, the nitty gritty and the difficulty of implementing these kinds of systems is really hard and change is really hard. The trough of disillusionment, I would argue, was expressed by the Congress in the 21st Century Cures Act of 2016, who said, all right, we aren't getting the kind of interoperability we want out of those systems. And we also are seeing that that wasn't the fault of the Meaningful Use Program and the High Tech Act. It's a behavioral problem. It's actually a behavioral problem in addition to technology. You need to have the technology in place, but it turns out that people with the technology still aren't going to do it unless they have strong incentive and or care it, and how about we do both? And the 21st Century Cures Act set, set up a little bit more of the care of the um, of the kick in uh, uh, kick in the pants, um, as well as incentives. Obviously, we want to move forward with value based purchasing and making interoperability easier. But you know that was certainly a part of it. Um, so now I would argue we're coming out of that. Right now, the dust has settled on a whole bunch of that. We've got policy levers, we've got motivation, and the opportunity to say, not that foundation's been laid by a ton of hard work by my predecessors. I get the benefit of saying. Thank you, guys. You built a great foundation. Now let's think about all the great things that we're going to do um, with it. And that's the opportunity that all of us have, I think, as we look forward and the excitement that I feel about, you know, where we are and where we're going. I like to ground us in something that isn't sort of obvious to people. And it wasn't obvious to me, actually, until I took this job and actually read the 21st Century Cures Act. I mean, I kind of hadn't paid full attention to it when it, when it, was, um, when it got passed. I mean, I looked, obviously paid some attention to it. But one of the things that's interesting is the High Tech Act which created the program that allowed $35 billion in federal incentives to, for the adoption of electronic health records, does not have a definition of interoperability in it, right? It's kind of amazing when you think back on that and you look through the high-tech act, it's like, wow, there's no definition of interoperability. That's kind of shocking. Um, 21st Century Cures Act actually defines interoperability. And they define, there are three key things to note here. One is they say that access to information needs to be without special effort. For those who have you know, the term meaningful use just sort of emblazoned in your brain and you can't think of it in any other context, um, we're, at ONC, we you know, see these words without special effort and they have the same you know, kind of uh, meaning for us. It was without special effort, without special effort. That's what the Congress said. Um, and by the way, 
that had very strong bipartisan support, um, the passage of the 21st Century Cures Act. So this wasn't just a, you know, sort of a, um, uh, just a, you know, sort of a whim, right? This back at the time where there was strong bipartisan support for these kinds of things, it was something like 98 senators and an equal proportion of the House support of the 21st Century Cures Act signed by President Obama and Vice President Biden. So, um, so, you know, so there's a lot of momentum behind this, right? Without special effort. Second thing it said is that without special effort needs to enable access to all electronically accessible health information. It didn't say standardized data elements. It didn't say data in electronic health records. It said all electronically accessible health information, regardless of where it lives, right? Really important point to just, you know, to keep in your heads as you think about information blocking. It's about the data. That's what they said. They said it's about the data. We don't care where it lives. Your problem, not, our, not society's problem, your problem if you're an actor. You've got to figure it out because that's what the law says. Final thing is it defines interoperability as sort of the natural state of things, right? It's really kind of interesting where it says things that do not, that are not impeded by information blocking, right? It's kind of an interesting flipping of the paradigm, right? It basically kind of says that the natural state is interoperability and it is only active information blocking that blocks that natural state. Right, and which when it went away flips it, right? Because before this, you sort of think of interoperability as something that I have to actively do. Oh, I have to actively interoperate with others. The Congress came along in the 21st Century Cures Act and said, no, you're thinking about it all wrong. You're thinking about it all wrong. Interoperability means the data should just be flowing and it is an unnatural act for anyone to step in the middle of it unless they have really good reasons. So, you know, again, really interesting paradigm shift, right? And something that wasn't obvious to me and, you know, and I think is, you know, kind of important to keep in your head as you think about what was the 21st Century Cures Act, or, uh, Act about? So ONC, our key areas of focus, um, I like to think of them in four categories, um, building, continuing to build the digital foundation, We've done a ton of work on electronic health records, laying that foundation, most hospitals and most uh, ambulatory practices now in the country using that, I already described that to you, but we continue to do work on data standards. I think Brian talked about the USCDI, continue to do work on saying we need to raise that floor on standardized data elements as the industry is able to, you know, sort of identify those, mature them through the great work of SNOMED and other standards development organizations and continue to, you know, to keep that floor rising and keep pressure on all of us and keep pressure on industry and government to, you know, to keep doing that. Um, we also need to look at health IT gaps. There were large parts of the care continuum, as we know, that didn't get the benefit of those incentive dollars. Um, the, the, um, uh, the administration has in every year submitted budget requests to the Congress to get additional funding for behavioral health IT, for LTPAC. Um, we haven't you know, gotten the benefit of that funding, but we are within the department saying, well, what else can we do? What are the existing levers that we have to be able to move forward on that? Um, so that's, you know, work that we continue to do. And I already described the health IT alignment policy across the department, which is to say all of our agency partners in the Department of Health and Human Services are going to put our money where our mouth is. We're going to have our policies and our market activities be a multiplier on the regulations that we're putting out in the market so that our purchasing is going to support the standards that we require in our regulations. So that's hopefully, you know, continues to build that digital foundation. Second is, you know, how do you make interoperability easy? We'll talk about TEFCA, we'll talk about APIs, was just to say, how do you remove excuses that people might have for not sharing information? And I understand, you know, I've been 20 years in the private sector, interoperability is hard, it's really hard, but the lower the activation energy, the easier you make it to happen is when people are able to raise it on their priority list. Um, because everyone's really busy, everyone's got a ton of things that they're trying to do, um, and this makes it easier for people to sort of raise it on the priority list and say, okay, I just need to do this much, and now I can have that kind of interoperability. Um, and then APIs we'll talk about as well, um, information blocking, and then finally, ensuring proper use of digital information and tools. We have a lot of work that we're doing on health equity, health equity by design, as we call it, and I'll touch on AI and our draft regulations related to AI. It wouldn't be a health IT conference if we didn't talk about AI, right? Um, so I'll make sure that I do that so you can walk away saying, yes, I had an health IT conference. Um, they talked about AI. So what are the key levers? Just for, you know, for all of you, I know all of you are, you know, kind of the, you know, sort of the, the PhDs in the health IT space. So I just like to, you know, sort of give you of the, you know, so the comprehensive list of what are the different rules and regulations that you ought to be tracking as you think about you know, how this starts to affect the market. Um, I told you about the health IT alignment policy that's already in place. HTI-1 is ONC's draft rule that's out right now. We put it out in March. Um, comments closed in June. 
and we are working on the final rule, which we are hoping to get out um, but before the end of the calendar year. It all depends on a whole bunch of things. Brian mentioned a potential government closure. We, of course, as the administration, are assuming that the Congress is going to do its job and not have a government closure. But um, and in the absence and, and assuming that that happens, um, you know, we are we are hoping and pushing very hard to have that out this calendar year as a as a final rule. Um, and that's got a number of really important dimensions in it that I'll describe. HDI two is the next second rule. That's a draft rule. We anticipate before the end of the calendar year having that draft rule out um, as well, which would sort of focus on a number of other areas related to public health, related to further patient engagement, um, and related to um, uh, you know prior off things like that um, that we're taking a really good hard look at. Um, and then we've got the appropriate disincentives draft rule, which is about the penalties for providers who are found by the Office of Inspector General to not be in compliance with the information blocking provisions. We're hoping to get that out before the end of this calendar year as well. Um, all of these things, ONC historically has done about one rule every four or five years. As you can see, we've got three rules that we're pushing out at the same time, plus TEFCA, which is at least as big as a rule, um, if not a rule itself. So we're operating at a pace that's unprecedented um, in the history of ONC, and that's because we're really impatient. And I'm really impatient, and I think that we have too much to do to be working on these five-year cycles, right? We have way too much to do. So we need to, you know, and the market expects it, patients expect it of us. So that's why we're pushing really hard, and we really appreciate all the support that we get from all of you in helping us do that. And then, you know, two things to just keep track of. Um, one is the CMS interoperability rule. I'll talk about it again um, a little bit later, but it's really important. It's a really important addition to the way that we're thinking about interoperability. ONC rules work on the provider side and talk about the certified vendors that are used by providers and enabling exchange through Fire APIs, through TEFCA, um, you know, all of the things that we're pushing really hard, the USCDI. CMS, our partner, is working in partnership to say, you know what, we're gonna do the same thing on the payer side. ONC, you don't have authorities over the payers, but we do. And so in the draft interoperability rule that, may, that you may know is already out there, they've got some regulations about payer use of fire APIs based on the same standards that ONC requires of providers and electronic health record vendors. So a lot of alignment there and a lot of, you know, sort of orchestration of levers to say, how do we um, make sure that we are, um, you know, kind of weaving together and leveraging each other's authorities across our federal agency partners to get as much of, you know, sort of a comprehensive uh, approach to the, uh, to the market as we possibly can. USCDI, I think a number of you are familiar with the USCDI. I'm just checking my time. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a set of data standards. We always call it a data standard. It's not really a data standard, obviously. It's a portfolio of data standards, a lot of it based on the, um, all the hard and great work that all of you do. Uh, and as I said, this is kind of a rising floor. Every year we have a process where we get market input, we get federal agency input, and we add additional um, uh, elements to this to be that foundation, that 80-20 kind of what's the basic minimum data set that you should expect in any arbitrary system across the healthcare delivery system. Um, we recognize that for particular use cases, for particular specialties, there are additional data elements that you want. This is designed to provide a foundation that you can build on to support those. Um, and right, I think I've, all of us appreciate the importance of just saying, what is the minimum data set I can count on? And then, you know, and then I can move from there. So we you know, continue to move forward. Um, importantly, in this administration, we've added a number of data elements related to health equity. Um, to be able to support the concept of health equity by design, meaning that everyone who's using, adopting, using, developing, um, and implementing health information technology ought to be thinking about health equity as a design construct. Like you think about safety, privacy, security, you ought to be thinking about health equity as well. And you can't do that if you don't have data that supports identification of health equity issues where they may arise. So we've done a bunch of work to include SDOH, tribal affiliation, sexual orientation, gender identity, race, ethnicity, language, number of other dimensions um, that we're focused on. And we're looking forward to um, adding behavioral health and a number of uh, behavioral health data elements. We um, are also in that vein, as I was describing as additional use cases, um, an initiative that we started in the, in the administration is what we call USCDI Plus, because we have a number of agency partners who had been approaching us saying, we really like the USCDI but you need to add 53 new data elements next year to support our particular mission goals. And we're, you know, kind of struggle with that because we're like, well, on the one hand, we totally appreciate and respect, right? That you'd absolutely need to be able to do that. And we also deeply respect and appreciate that you want to root it in the USCDI. On the other hand, if I take all those agency requests and add all of those up, 
we're going to be adding you know hundreds of data elements every year to the US CDI, and the industry would choke on that, right? Providers would, health IT developers, because it's really hard work, and it's hard to just do that. Um, so one of the things that we did is this, we've launched this US CDI Plus initiative where we work with our agency partners on their specific programs to say, how do we accelerate and build on the US CDI, add additional data elements to your, support your programmatic needs, and then you can actually use your programmatic authorities for people who participate in your programs to get them to adopt these additional data standards. But it doesn't have to be the minimum data set that it covers you know, sort of the entire landscape. Um, so in that way that we can, we can sort of accelerate in particular use cases, we can support our agency partners, which is critical and really important to ONC, um, but we can also allow the industry to keep, more, keep moving forward with that you know, sort of rising floor of a minimum data set. We've got active initiatives going on with the CDC for public health to imagine that, try to create a nationwide public health data model. Um, that would be really good. So we're working with jurisdictions and the CDC on saying, how do we do that based on the US CDI? Um, we also have a very active um, uh, US CDI plus initiative with CMS um, to help support the quality roadmap that they have. Uh, many of you may be familiar with their quality measure roadmap. We want to help to support them with the data elements required to support that. Um, we also have already gotten place with HRSA UDS plus which is basically a US CDI plus for UDS reporting. Same concept saying, well, there's UDS reporting, work with HRSA to actually fire enable it. So we worked with them to set up a fire server so they can actually get that as a fire um, transaction um, with fire resources and also extending the US CDI to support the additional UDS data elements that they wanted to include. And then finally, we are just launching now a US CDI plus for cancer initiative with um, the National Cancer Institute and the FDA to support the addition of, for ca of cancer data elements to support a number of cancer use cases that um, NCI is supporting, the FDA is supporting, and the Cancer Moonshot from the White House. So really excited about that, and actually one that's in the wings here, but just to point it out to you is we are just about to launch a US CDI Plus for behavioral health um, initiative to add a behavioral health um, specific data elements, um, working with SAMHSA, working with CMMI, um, the Center for um, uh, you know, the Models, um, and, uh, and working with our other agency partners on that. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead here and talk about FIRE for a second. Um, FIRE is the instantiation from an ONC perspective of that direction from the Congress to have API-based exchange without special effort, right? Without special effort, without special effort, that's what it said. Um, we put into regulation the requirement that we put into place, the requirement went into effect on April 5th, 2021, um, short, you know, four months after I came in. Um, we put that into effect on April 5th. And um, as a part of that, all certified electronic health record vendors were required to make available a standard FIRE API to all of their customers by the end of last calendar year. All, all, all. So all of them were required not just to certify their API to that FIRE API specification, they were required to make it available to their customers. CMS, our partner, follows on that. And in their payment rules, if you track those, they actually have provisions that say that by the third quarter of this calendar year, all of you who are participating in certain payment programs, you're actually required to have that version of the software in place in order for you to participate in these payment programs. So we've got you know, both sides of it now that are pushing forward to say, we need to have this FIRE API foundation across the entire industry to allow scalability of FIRE-based exchange um, where it makes sense and where it's appropriate. Um, that also, I should just point out, um, just on that, you know, on the bottom there, the goal isn't a read-only FIRE API that makes available the US CDI, right? That is the current requirement. The goal is to lay the foundation for the richer type of exchange that FIRE enables. And that's why we see this as, great, this is the first step. Now what? Now, how do we think about Firebase Exchange the way God intended um, to be able to do the kind of interactivity um, that every other part of the economy literally benefits from as it thinks about interactivity of systems? We need to bring that to healthcare so we can have more automation, um, more productivity when we have um, not enough workforce to be able to do all the work that we need to do. We don't have the problem of technology replacing people in healthcare. We have the problem that we don't have enough people to do the work that they have. So we want to be able to say, how do we provide technology and automation to allow them to be able to do that additional work on behalf of patients? Um, the uh, uh, one thing I like to point out is, and I sort of alluded to it before with the CMS interoperability rule, is that this fire, this fire thing, um, we start with that, with the you know, requirement that it be made available in electronic health record systems. As I pointed out, you know, that's a requirement from 2022. Then our partners at CMS pick up the ball on that 
and they say on the left-hand side, providers who are using those certified systems, um, which they're required to do for payment programs, you're actually required to have that version of the software in place and to actually use that API. And then they say, we're also going to fire enable our own data. So the BCDA and the DPC pilot that some of you may be familiar with, the DPC pilot is fantastic. Um, it's still pilot, but it makes available Medicare fee-for-service claims data to providers. It allows them to use a bulk fire um, exchange to get all the claims, all the Medicare fee-for-service claims on the patients who they have a treatment relationship with. Not just the claims they submitted, all of them. So they get the benefit of the breadth of that information from a care continuity perspective to supplement the cl deep clinical data that they already have in their own systems. And CMS then, in their draft interoperability rule, which I was talking about before, extends that further and says, oh, regulated payers, you actually are required, you're gonna be required to do the same thing. If the final rule ends up being you know, the same as the draft, obviously it's draft rule. Um, so their payer patient API, they already put in place, the payer provider API or the provider access API as, um, as they call it in their rule, again, would allow regulated payers, commercial payers, to make available a fire API so the provider can access all the claims data, fee for service, risk, all of it through their um, through a fire API to be able to provide get that perspective on continuity of care and uh, combine that in their own system with their with uh, the clinical information. Right, I think it's huge. I think it's a huge breakthrough for the industry. Really important and one that we really support and are working really hard with CMS to you know to make it a reality. Uh, the other thing I would just point to there's a number of other things there. That Par D for those who aren't familiar with the with that that's Da Vinci um, the the Da Vinci project that's prior off, right? In their draft rule, they are requiring support for a standardized approach to prior off. Prior auth is one of those things that you know all of us are vexed by because everyone hates it, um, but no one seems to be able to solve it. <laughs> um, so we're working really hard with our CMS partners to say, all right, you've got the payer side of it, you've got the policy side of it, and we're working really hard to think about the EHR side of it. Many of you may have seen the RFI that we had on prior auth. We got a ton of feedback from industry, overwhelming support from industry for ONC to do something on the EHR side to make that you know, sort of prior auth uh, um, uh, type of automation uh, a reality. So we're looking really hard at that and are, you know, are hopeful we'll be able to do something there. Um, HRSA, I already described that. And then CDC, we're working with CDC through Helios on a number of different um, sort of, you know, more, more new, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, breakthrough kinds of um, uses of fire for situational awareness data, for access, bulk access to immunization registries. Um, but my point is that we got a number of federal agencies who are saying, let's leverage those fire-based capabilities and let's get the industry to move forward by acting in, you know, in the ways that we want industry to act, which is to make information available via fire APIs where appropriate and do that in an open architecture, open standard um, kind of approach. The last thing I'll point to is the need for TEFCA on top of all of that. And I'll come to that later, but I just wanted to point it out here since we've got all these fire APIs. Um, TEFCA is really important for fire scalability. I would even put it the other way. You're not gonna have fire API scalability without the kind of trust services that you get from something like Tefka. And the reason that is, is that scalability of fire APIs is really hard. If you're a payer and you wanna be able to get information from 500 different providers with whom who are in your network and you're authorized to get that information, right now you have to literally go to each one of them, do a whole dance around data use agreement, onboarding, security handshake, um, testing, getting all of that in place, electronic endpoint address, and you're going to fat finger that 50% of the time, and then you're going to call them again and say, wait a minute, was that, you know, uh, backslash, backsplash, or just backslash colon, right, every single time. That's the way it works today, and it's really hard. Tefka offers the scalability and the trust services to say, take all that off the table. Networks solve that problem. That's what they're designed to do, and then just allow the fire APIs to interact with each other. That's what we're doing with Tefka, and I'll describe, you know, what, um, uh, the timeline on that for a second, in a second. All right, I'm gonna, um, oh, this, uh, one thing I just do, do wanna mention is we do, we are doing a lot of work to try to motivate industry toward use of fire APIs. So we've got, you know, a number of things that we have in place um, from a regulatory perspective, but we also wanna watch the market and provide information back to the market. So one of the things that you may not be familiar with, but we're gonna do more, and we're certainly gonna do more to make this dashboard something that isn't user hostile, which is the way, which is, uh, you know, how it is today, um, is Lantern. So Lantern, um, is a product that ONC has, totally open source. Anyone is welcome to download it and you know tweak it to your uh, heart's desire, um, where we actually just scan all of the known fire endpoints that we can find across the industry um, that are required in regulation. And we, um, we document in real time 
the status of those, which ones are down, which ones actually are supporting the services that they claim to be supporting. And that's what you see in this dashboard. And if you go down, if you scroll down, you would see it by vendor. You'd see which, you know, how many Epic ones are up and running, how many Cerner ones are up, or up and running, which ones are you know, actually giving success, which ones are throwing back 404 errors. Um, and that gives a real time sense of what's actually happening in the market. Vendors can come and certify their system. That doesn't mean that they've implemented them. Right? I think all of you deeply appreciate that. So we're trying to get at that to say, we're actually gonna use this open source product, make the information available to the market, and then hopefully the market decides that, oh, I don't like the fact that you know half of my servers, my endpoints are actually non-functional, and I don't like that ONC is posting that publicly on a website. Um, so that's you know what we're doing with Lantern, and we're gonna to continue to do more and more of that. If there are any payers in the room, we're coming for you too. Um, we are actually building in now, looking for the payer endpoints that are required in CMS regulations already for member-facing APIs, and we're going to post those as well. So if you'd like to you know, be in the green here, um, please let us know what your endpoints are. We'll find them anyway, um, but please let, let us know what your endpoints are, and we'd love to be able to put you up on the dashboard. Tefka. Um, trust exchange framework and common agreement. I'm going to go quickly through some of these slides. Um, so Tefka is nationwide network interoperability. As many of you may know, we do have a lot of network interoperability across the country. Um, it's very, it's still a lot really fragmented. At the state and local level, we've got a ton of state health information exchanges of various degrees of, of capability and functionality and sustainability, and most of them not connected with each other in any real meaningful way. Um, we do have nationwide networks, which are great. I you know, did a lot of work um, prior to joining the federal government um, on that, and I think that they've done terrific work. Um, but there are a bunch of gaps still that are, I would argue are too hard for the private sector to um, overcome on, on its own. Um, the federal government needs to play a role at this point to get us to the next evolution of network interoperability. The analogy that I like to use that was the direction from the Congress was basically to say our experience in network interoperability ought to be the same experience that we have with cell phones where you've got AT&T and mobile and Verizon and T-Mobile and all those systems, um, all private networks, but our user experience is that it's a single network, right? We don't worry about, is my AT&T phone gonna connect to my, T, to the, to my friend's T-Mobile phone? That is all behind the scenes, all taken care of. That's the direction that we got from the Congress to say, that's what you need to do with clinical interoperability. So if you're um, a participant in the Indiana Health Information Exchange or your local health information exchange or Care Quality or Commonwealth or Epics Care Everywhere, you shouldn't even care. You just participate in the system that you want to participate in because it gives you the pricing and the features and the functionality you want. And you should have the assurance that you will have basic interoperability with anyone else, regardless of which network they're on. That's what Tefka is designed to accomplish. Also, other gaps that the private sector finds too difficult to accomplish on its own. I was there on that side. I saw it firsthand. Private sector can't do it. Public health, first and foremost, right? Really complicated, really hard for the private sector to do that. So that's why we're working very closely with the CDC on accelerating public health participation in these nationwide networks. We need, we believe that public health needs to be front and center in these nationwide networks. And we're working really hard to make sure that that, you know, that, that can happen. Um, payer exchange is another one. That's more a market phenomenon because of the jousting between payers and providers, payers were basically excluded and still are from the nationwide networks. Um, we're reaching out and embracing payers as a part of TEFCA to say payers need to be a part of this ecosystem, but it also needs to have the reciprocity that providers want. Um, because providers feel right now, understandably, with existing standards, IHE-based standards, that that's a one-way exchange. The payers get all the data and providers don't get anything back. We're, that's one of the keys to why we want to enable fire-based exchange in 2024 in TEFCA to allow payers to implement the CMS-required APIs to allow claims data to be made available to providers so that you have that basic sense of reciprocity, that a provider now feels like, okay, great, I can make my clinical data or my patient's clinical data available to the payers. And in return, I know I can get all of my claims data back from that payer on demand whenever I need it, right? That's the kind of, you know, sort of industry, um, you know, sort of stalemate that we're trying to break through with uh, with Tefka Exchange. Um, we, uh, let me jump forward. Oh, I need to definitely talk about some dates, some really important dates. Tefka is going to go live before the end of this calendar year. We're targeting mid-December. Again, you know, government closure could affect that, but right now we're targeting mid-December um, for go live of Tefka, and the majority of QHINs we believe are going to be ready to um, ready to go. Then that'll be a signature moment, I think, for the industry to be able to say we are now at the place now that we have that nationwide interoperability, network interoperability that all of us are hoping for. Um, the fire enablement of that is a fast follow. 
The Tefka that we inherited coming in in this administration was silent on fire. So we have to basically kind of build that, um, build that in. But we also believe that it's fundamentally important, both the fire and Tefka. And that's why we push really hard and have the expectation that's going to go live in 2024. We're already working on the um, update to the quality of, to the um, technical framework and the common agreement, which is the user agreement that every um, participant signs. Um, we're already working on that in draft form and expect to release that in the first quarter of 2024 and have Q all of the qualified health information networks adopt that as a required um, exchange pattern. So, and the expectation is that Firebase Exchange will go live in 2024, um, which will be enormous. And one of the things that'll be really important for is individual access to allow individuals to be able to access their own information in a way that they're not able to in networks today because of the technical limitations of IHE based exchange um, for B2C kind of exchange. I mean, IHE is great. I mean, it you know, supports tens of millions of transactions every single day, um, but it's a B2B kind of construct, right? That was, that's what it was built for. Um, now trying to force fit a B2C type of, you know, type of pattern and that has been really hard for the industry to overcome. And the overlay of, of the complexity that HIPAA um, has with respect to um, uh, impermissible disclosures is also a difficulty that, um, that you know, IHE um, uh, based exchange doesn't help to overcome as well. So fire based exchange though does. Fire and OAuth allows you to have the kind of end to end assurance that providers who are the ones who are going to be held accountable for this, um, providers and payers who are HIPAA regulated entities, they're the ones who are held accountable at the end of the day for an impermissible disclosure. Fire and OAuth allows them to have the assurance that they want to be able to have to say, okay, I can do this, do this over a network now where I'm not the one identity proofing the patient, right? I get it now because I can do that. Um, and so that's why fire is really important um, for Tefka to be able to, you know, sort of get the scalability for patients so that they can truly have what all of us want, which is a patient just being able to say, where are my records? Push a button, get all those records from all those different places. Right? I think that's all the simple goal, the simple yet very complicated goal that all of us want to be able to have. Um, I'm going to touch on two more things quickly. Um, information blocking regulations. I won't go into, I, I assume a lot of you know the details. I'm happy to walk in, walk through any of the details. A couple of things I just want to point out. One is 21st Century Cures Act was passed in 2016 and we are still implementing it. Um, good God. Um, so we've, been, we've done a lot to say this needs to get out of the gate. It needs to get done. Congress was very clear about this. Um, so we came in, none of it had been implemented, unfortunately. Um, and uh, and uh, we put the rule in place on April 5th, 2021. And we also are just about to release the draft rule, as I described before, that would fill the missing piece of the puzzle, which is what are the penalties on providers who are found not to be in compliance with information blocking? The law was complicated in a number of different ways. It identified three actors, providers, health information networks, and technology developers. It didn't, payers are not actors, by the way. I'll just do, do, do as a side note. If I was there, I would have added payers for sure, but the Congress didn't. So just for all of your awareness, payers are not actors in information blocking, but providers, technology developers, health information networks. And it also gave OIG, the Office of Inspector General, authority to issue civil monetary penalties of up to a million dollars per incident on technology developers and health information networks, but it kind of carved out providers. And it said, providers, you're gonna have appropriate disincentives that we're gonna kick over to, um, uh, to the Secretary of Health and Human Services to define, and we're also going to constrain the Secretary of Health and Human Services to using existing authorities to do that. And so that made it really complicated. Um, so we've worked really hard over the last two and a half years um, with Secretary Becerra um, directly involved in pushing us to fill this enforcement gap. It's not fair to providers, it's not fair to patients, it's not fair to everyone else. Um, so that's, you know, that's coming. As I said, in the OIG rule, um, enforcement has started. September 1st, 2023, OIG started enforcement. They were clear in their rule that they're just doing investigation enforcement right now on health information um, networks and technology developers because there are no penalties defined. But as soon, but they also pointed out that as soon as um, the department establishes the penalties on providers, enforcement will automatically kick in um, on providers as well. Why is, um, why is that important? So, you know, first off, the definition of providers is really broad in the 21st Century Cures Act. So some of the you know, questions on the left-hand side, am I I'm a pharmacist? Am I subject to information blocking? Yes. Um, uh, is a provider who does not participate in Medicare or Medicaid still an actor under information blocking? Yes. Um, are clinicians and healthcare providers who do not use any certified health IT subject to information blocking? Yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. All of those. On the right-hand side, you have the definition of providers. You can see that it is very broad. 
it's pharmacists, it's labs, it's physical therapists. Again, this comes from the 21st Century Cures Act. It's not stuff that ONC is making up. Um, very broad, very far reaching. Um, we have a complaint process. It is a complaint driven process. OIG, um, ONC does not have a police force that can show up on site and say, all right, hands down everyone. <laughs> We're gonna see if your information blocking. Um, it is a complaint driven process. Um, and that's really important. We've, you know, we've established our process, um, you know, with OIG on how we handle complaints. And the reason the provider piece is so important is if you look at the data, which we update every month on our website, you can go to our website and find this. The data through September shows that the vast majority of complaints still, we get about one complaint a day. The vast majority of complaints still are patients complaining about providers. I don't know what people's expectations were, but Right now, it's like 85% of the complaints are from patients, and about 85% of their allegations are about providers not making information available to them. So then you go back and say, oh, and then we've got this enforcement gap where we don't have penalties on the providers who are the ones who, are, at least right now, are being named as the, you know, the, um, uh, the uh, having the most complaints against. That's another part of the importance of saying we need to fill that enforcement gap, and that's why we're pushing really hard on that. Um, the last thing I just want to touch on. Um, is uh, I promised that I would talk about AI. Uh, predictive decision support intervention. I'm just gonna say this in two minutes because I, th I think it actually is relatively simple. ONC regulations, draft regulations on AI, um, we in the FDA and the Department of Health and Human Services are really the only agencies that actually have, I mean, only, FDA obviously is very well established, right? Se over 700 software as a medical device um, you know, um, approvals to date. So they obviously are very mature, very established in, you know, AI based tools, and they've got, you know, a whole program and a whole process for um, doing those approvals for, um, for safety and effectiveness. Um, ONC now has our draft regulations that covers the use of AI or the availability of AI in certified electronic health record systems. And our rules have two um, approaches, but the fundamental concept underlying it is not about approving the systems as FDA does, FDA's authorities is specifically on software as a medical device and approving them for safety and effectiveness. ONC's approach is to say, we're gonna focus on transparency to the users of certified electronic health records. So the Epic, Cerner's, Athena Health of the world. Um, we're gonna focus on just transparency to the clinical user so that that customer of the electronic health record knows what AI enabled tools are actually embedded in the system. They have some basic information um, a representation of a model card or nutrition label, as people call it. Um, and we've proposed 14 data elements that would need to be made available to those uh, customers to allow them to evaluate, is this an algorithm or an, an AI-based tool that I want to use in my setting? So we're not saying that's a good tool, that's a bad tool. All we're saying is you need to surface that information, make it available to the customer so that they can then determine. They do it every day. They do it with formulary. They do it with clinical decision making. Um, put this in their hands. They will, they will figure out how to make the right decisions on that. And then we also require that the certified technology developers, the EHR developers, have some type of formal risk management process um, regarding how they decide what AI-enabled tools are going to make available in their systems. So again, we're not telling them how to do it. What we're, what we're saying is you need to have a formal process. You can't just have this be an ad hoc thing. Um, and you need to make available what that formal process is so that all of us can learn from it. And so the customers, as they're deciding which systems to, to purchase, can decide based, you know, use that as, a, as another decision criteria. So I know that I covered a lot of ground, but I think we have a few minutes for, for Q&A. So let me pause here, and I hope that gives you a good sense of all the different things we have going on. have a little sit down okay <laughs> i take praise and criticism as well too so it doesn't just have to be a comment <laughs> and i think allison's got a microphone here um and we can field online questions as well yeah actually we do we could start off with one brian and mickey um this this was sent in at the beginning of the presentation but i think it touched a couple other points during the the course of your talk um will there be incentive monies or strategies to make ehrs accessible for those not originally included in the incentive programs so like long-term care family planning clinics and other organizations that are often poorly funded yeah it's a great question um so um it is a it is a real focus area in the department um and one of the, you know, what's interesting is uh, a, a bunch of the leadership of the department, Secretary Becerra, Deputy Secretary Palm, Chief of Staff, Sean McCluskey, all of them actually were on the Hill, right? Secretary Becerra was a congressman for 20 years. They were on the Hill 
at the passage of high tech. And so now they're coming into the leadership. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions they had for ONC is, so how do we do? I mean, <laughs> right? We, 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 put that, we put that policy into place. Where are we now? And one of the things that they are acutely aware of because they formulated you know, the High Tech Act was that we had these gaps. And so, as I said, we have submitted budgets, budget requests called A19s every year to the Congress um, through CMS to identify basically how do we create a meaningful use program for LTPAC and for behavioral health. Um, we haven't, you know, sort of gotten congressional funding for, you know, for those. And so what we're doing in the department itself, I can focus on behavioral health for a second, is the secretary has asked us to um, help to formulate a department-wide behavioral health IT strategy. And what we're doing is we're working with our agency partners to say, we've got a lot of funding actually that goes to behavioral health. If you look at HRSA and SAMHSA and CMS and you know, a variety of those, but it's still siloed um, in each of those programs. And it's not consistent in its availability of funds for health information technology. So we're working um, with those agency partners to say, how do we get consistency across all of them to say that each of you should make more money available for health information technology, and each of you should provide more direction and consistent direction on what it means to purchase um, health information technology. So that's work underway. One of the other things I would just point to um, also as a part of that is we also, have, as a part of that, tried to make everyone recognize that every organization doesn't need a full-blown electronic health record, right? Especially think about the behavioral health environment. You've got outpatient, you've got residential treatment centers, you've got psychiatric hospitals. They have very different needs. And we need to appreciate that where we are now with technology um, offers a lot of more flexibility and perhaps lightweight technologies that can help them accomplish what they need to accomplish without the barrier of having to have a full-blown EHR system. So that's another part of the strategy as well. That's great, Mickey, thanks. I think we had a question back over here. Can I, can you, oh, good morning. Great presentation. I, I'm Philip from the Portuguese eHealth Agency. So you talked a lot about building this network and you focused quite a lot on the vendor side. My, my question is, when you are enabling access to that network, are you also considering the client side of those vendors? So those vendors exist to provide services to healthcare providing uh, institutions. Are you linking them together somehow? So are you establishing a trust link to the uh, providers of healthcare themselves as well as uh, while you are building this, this network of trust? Yeah, are you speaking about TEFCA? The, yes. It, okay. Yeah. Um, so the, the TEFCA model is sort of an organic model to say that it's about network to network interoperability. So what we want to be able to do is enable the exchange across networks with the, you know, sort of the, the, the you know, the implicit understanding that those networks are actually in the business of providing services to, you know, to their participants that offer value to them. So um, we certainly want to be able to do things that um, make it easier for those participants at the end of the day, do the kind of exchange that we want to be able to do. But a lot of that is really sort of delegated to those qualified health information networks who all have to demonstrate that they actually are mature, um, you know, to, to be eligible for that. And uh, sorry, the other piece of that is we are also working with our agency partners like CMS, for example, is already putting into their regulations, you know, requirements for um, or, or the allowances and incentive programs for participants, for providers, for example, who use TEFCA-based exchange um, to meet certain program requirements, some of those programs. So hopefully that helps it, you know, helps make life easier for them as well if they just sort of realize that, oh, okay, I can connect to TEFCA and get a whole bunch of, you know, my work done that I need to get done for CMS um, in a much easier fashion than I can today. All right, I think we have another round. Yeah, question. and Mickey, this is a really internationally diverse audience you've got this morning, so we've got one um, here more oriented towards that. So does ONC have interactions with its European counterparts and the in-construction EU health data space? Um, if so, how is that working? We do. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's through a number of different activities, but, you know, one of the key activities is through the Global Digital Health, health Global Digital Health Partnership, the GDHP, which ONC um, in the U.S., I should say, and the ONC um, representing the U.S. was the chair of in this calendar year. And I think it's um, it was India the previous year. It's going to the Netherlands next year. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's, I think, a lot, but a lot of the work on, you know, collaboration around IPS, for example, um, and other kinds of activities. So that's a primary way, I think, that we've been working. But we certainly work with international standards development organizations and others, um, you know, to work with international partners, for sure. Great. Thank you. Got a question over here. 
Hi. Kevin Donnelly um, was here for the beginning of the hype cycle and the uh, uh, terror is human. Um, yesterday, Modern Healthcare published that 85 million Americans have had their um, PHI breached in uh, this year, and that's up from 38 million last year. As I think about all the great things that are happening relative to the build out of our infrastructure and the ability to freely share data, which is awesome. Um, what are we doing from a government perspective relative to the fact that we've got these massive breaches going on? And back into Air is Human, um, we talked about 747s crashing. If that was happening, um, you know, we would certainly be doing quite a bit about air safety. Um, and yep. so what's happening on the on really on the cybersecurity side? Yeah. Of um, so there is a um, there's a U.S. government wide um, very active initiative on cybersecurity, uh, you know, at large. Um, and the Department of Health and Human Services is the I forget what they get, SRMA or something. The, cert, the, the sector representative for healthcare as a part of that, um, uh, you know, U.S. government discussion. So I can't sort of relay the details of that now, but there is a, a plan that's you know been put in place by all federal agencies and HHS for the healthcare sector that's looking at all the different levers that we have and the opportunities to help the industry move forward on you know on, on basic cybersecurity. Um, you know, kinds of issues. So we definitely recognize that it is a growing problem. Um, and it's, you know, sort of a the national security problem in many dimensions as well as we think about the criticality of this infrastructure and the criticality of these kinds of of these kind of networks, you know, TEPCA being one of them as we think about it. So there'll be more to come and more, you know, more published on that. But, you know, I can assure you, I can't tell you anything about the details or, you know, or the dates, but I can assure you that there's a tremendous amount of effort going on across the, um, across the U.S. government led by um, the, led by the White House directly, and um, the National Security Council, and that HHS at the top leadership is you know directly participating in that. All right, thank you very much. It was a great okay. presentation. Thank you. I'm going. There's one more thing. I'm going to invite Don back up, and I will go sit down. Sounds like a dance, isn't it? It is. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to present uh, to you, sir. Uh, the appreciate with the appreciation from Snowman International for participating in the expo and for all you do, uh, not just for the United States, but for people all around the world. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, uh, we're going to call the session to a close. I hope everyone has a great day. Please visit the Expo Hall and uh, attend the concurrent sessions on the program today and tomorrow. Thank you.